Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. This is episode 386. Welcome back. We've got a relatively streamlined program this week, so I hope you guys all enjoy. We're going to read a paper called Freemasonry and the Holocaust. Great paper done by Ira Gilbert of the Illinois Lodge of Research, a past district deputy grandmaster and past education chairman and all kinds of great stuff. Before we get into that, a few updates. Skull and Crown Limited is working still. We're doing some R&D on production once we nail down just the right leather with our process. Then we're going to show you the flagship product we're going to bring out, kind of a pack actually, and it'll be really exciting. If you haven't already, please find Skull and Crown on Instagram or go to skullandcrownltd.com and give us a follow there. I also want to say thank you to all of our newest YouTube subscribers. Thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate it. If you are listening to the show on YouTube or you found it on YouTube, give us a subscribe. I guarantee that if you are into this kind of thing, that's what this episode is. That's what these episodes are every single week. So you really don't have to worry about content shifting too much from week to week. So if you like it now, you're going to love it in the future also. So hit that like, subscribe button, and we really appreciate it. Uh, Lastly, before we get into some content, the article I read last week regarding politics and religion in lodges really stirred it up a little bit. And it was designed to, but what I really loved was the great conversations and the unique perspectives of the gentlemen out there, and in some cases ladies, who put it together and showed me some alternative ways of looking at why we ban those topics. Ultimately, it was a great conversation. I still stand by my assertion, but great conversation nonetheless. And again, a special thanks out there to those who read the article instead of just saying no, period, on Facebook without reading it or read like half the paper and didn't get into the meat of it, which was the latter half of the paper. But anyway, I digress. Let's get into the paper right after this. Now comes the point in the show where I ask you to help support this show. How do we do that? Well, we have a bunch of different ways to do that today. If you head on over to WCYpodcast.com, you can click on direct donation through PayPal, which we briefly touched on in the beginning of the program. Of course, you can make that one-time donation or you can sign up to be a monthly contributor. Contributing $2 a month, $5, or even $10 a month, whatever you choose really helps the program out. Of course, we have a limited edition shop where you can pick up any number of items that come direct from us. Help us out by going to MasonicRevival.com, but also we have some other affiliates that are really important. Bankers Best, one of the most unique things we've ever done, is to work with Brother Levi Banker out of St. Louis who owns his own company called Bankers Best Beard and Skin Care. He's been so generous. If you head to WCYPodcast.com, click on More, then click on Bankers Best, and you can check out a bunch of the different products he's got. He's got a whole line of beard care products skin care, oils, balms, all of this stuff, and he has been doing it a long time. He knows a lot about it. Everything is handmade, quality items. We even came up with the King Solomon's Reserve Beard Balm, which is a few years old now, but remains one of the great products that he still offers. Even the artwork on the bottle was done by a brother. The nice thing about this particular product is 50% of the proceeds come back to the program. If you're a history guy like me, then you'll be pleased to know that what makes the beard oil and balm very special is that it was made utilizing the fragrances specific to the exports of King Solomon's time and location, which is amazing. So black fig and honey is the formula. Luxurious scent, as Levi says, truly fit for our first Grandmaster. If you use the promo code BBWCY357 at checkout, you'll also get a little bit of a percentage off. Please check that out. Bankers Best or just head on over to buybankersbest.com. We also have a code with on it you can go to our website click on more then go to on it and you can click through any of the links here or just go to on it.com and use the promo code wcy at checkout you'll get 10 percent off and they'll send a little bit back to the program to help us out and of course it's business time the book that i wrote with 
John T. Ruark. It is making some real waves and people are using it and seeing success. So check that out on Amazon. You can click right to it. You can get it on Audible, Kindle, or in print, even on iBooks. And last but not least, I want to ask you to check out the Great Books program. You'll see the banner for it on the left-hand side, Intellectual Linear Progression. Use the promo code WCY, or you can just click on that link there, and you'll actually go right to the website and hear a little bit from Scott Hambrick about how awesome the program is. So that's it. I hope you guys enjoy, and thank you so much for helping us out. All right, so this piece is Freemasonry and the Holocaust. It comes from the Illinois Lodge of Research, volume number 18, page 13 by Ira Gilbert. I highly recommend, if you have not gotten the application for the show or the show app, please do yourself a favor and grab that, because what I'm going to do is scan this article and put it into the app, as I always do, but this week it is particularly of note due to the amount of pictures that are in the article as well. So it'll help you visualize and construct the ideas in your mind a little better. Uh, there is nothing graphic in these. It's mostly arts and pictures of lodge rooms. I did want to let you know that. But here we go. Freemasonry and the Holocaust by Ira Gilbert. A few years ago, I was helping a friend from Belgium prepare his application for the permanent residence in the United States. One of the questions asked regarded membership in any organizations that advocated an overthrow of the United States government. In preparation for his negative answer, I asked my friend in what organizations he maintained membership. There was a hesitancy in his response to this query. When I pressed for elaboration on his answer, he responded that he was a Freemason. My friend related that his father was also a Freemason. His father held a high-level job with a worldwide organization. Yet, I was informed that if it became known he was a Freemason, his father would lose his position and be ostracized on the business world in Belgium. He was also reticent about giving his own status as a Freemason for fear of reprisals in his home country. I then started wondering about prejudice against Freemasonry in Europe. This led me to further interest in the treatment of Freemasons during the Holocaust. The world is well aware of the treatment of people of the Jewish faith during this dark time in world history. There is also awareness, although to a lesser amount, that other ethnic groups were interned in Nazi prison camps. People of the Catholic faith, gypsies, and those in the gay communities were also persecuted during the Nazi occupation of Europe. However, Little has been published about the treatment of Freemasons by the Nazi regime. Not only the Nazis persecuted Freemasons, but also the fascist government of Italy subjected the Freemasons, although to a lesser amount than the Nazis. While the feelings about Freemasonry in Italy during the Holocaust were not as fervent as Hitler's quote-unquote final solution, the results were the same, eradication of Freemasonry. Hitler viewed Freemasonry as being part of a Jewish conspiracy to take over the German government. This is not a new idea. The relationship between Freemasonry and the Jewish people has a long and varied history. In order to understand the German views of Jewish participation in the Masonic fraternity, some discussion of the relationship of Masonry and the Jewish people is helpful. Hitler viewed Freemasonry as a Masonic Jewish plot to take over control of the German government. This is not a new version of the anti-Masonic thought. Since the time when the craft guilds of operative masonry became the Masonic lodges of speculative masonry, there have been moments of anti-Masonic feelings. Drawn by a desire to live by the Masonic tenets of brotherly love, relief, and truth, leaders in the fields of government, business, and religion became master masons. Due to the secrecy inherent in the Masonic order, myths about Freemasonry abound. Many thought that the world had come to be ruled by the Freemasons. Freemasons were thought to direct the fortunes of countries, the press, the financial world, and the church. In the year 1738, Pope Clement XII issued his proclamation entitled Eminenti Apostolatus Specula, thus becoming the first prohibition against Freemasonry issued by the Catholic Church. Shortly thereafter, in the year 1738, Sultan Muhammad I banned Freemasonry, which became an atheistic organization in the Ottoman Empire. On July 15, 1978, the Islamic Jurisdictional College, interpreting Sharia law, 
issued a ruling that Freemasonry is a dangerous and clandestine organization. Shortly thereafter, in Spain, Miguel Primo de Rivera, the current dictator, abolished Freemasonry, and in September 1928, the government closed one of the two Grand Lodges in that country. In 1940, General Francisco Franco ordered that being a Mason was punishable by jail sentence of up to six years, and for those Masons, up to the 18th degree, and for those Masons with higher degrees, higher sentences. The suppression of Freemasonry in Spain continued until the 1970s. Other countries in the world held similar views of Freemasonry, some lasting until the current time. The earliest record of a person of the Jewish heritage becoming a Freemason appears to be regarding Edward Rosen, who became a member of a lodge in London, England, in the year 1732. People of Jewish descent had not heretofore been Masons. The raising of Edward Rosen created a stir in Freemasonry and resulted in some lodges having a debate on whether or not they should admit Jewish members. In France, the French Revolution brought enlightened thought to the French people and brought the emancipation of the Jews. In fact, in the year 1869, a Jew became Grand Master of the Scottish Rite in Paris, France at the time. French lodges belonged to the French Grand Orient Grand Lodge. Later, anti-Semitism took hold and French lodges also became somewhat anti-Semitic. In Scandinavia, Masonry was declared officially Christian and Jewish members were excluded. It is not surprising that the longest history of anti-Semitism occurred in Germany. Jews were uniformly excluded from Freemasonry. This was a mirror of the general feeling in German society as a whole. Men petitioning for Masonic membership were questioned to their religion, and brethren who attempted lodge visitation were not admitted if they admitted that they were of a Jewish background. However, in Germany, there was some divergence of attitudes regarding the treatment of Jews. There were two classifications of Masonic lodges in Germany at that time. There were three Grand Lodges as well as lodges affiliated with Grand Lodges in other countries. Some lodges permitted Masons who were raised in other countries to become affiliated in Germany. When speaking of the Holocaust, most people tend to think only of the genocide of approximately 6 million people of Jewish descent who perished in the Nazi prison camps. Most accounts of the Holocaust have focused on the perils of the Jewish community. However, many reports of the Holocaust state that the Holocaust refers to Jews, Gypsies, Freemasons, and others as being interred in the prison camps and being sent to the gas chambers. Comparatively little has been written about the other categories of people that were on the receiving end of the atrocities committed by the Nazi regime during that great war known as the Holocaust. Millions of people were Soviet POWs. These were political enemies of the German regime. Some other political prisoners were the 1.8 to 2 million ethnic Polish men, women, and children. The final group of those who were interred and later executed were somewhere between 80,000 and 200,000 people who were arrested solely because they were members of that organization known as the Freemasons. There is such a wide range of numbers because while the original arrest was due to Masonic membership, some were also members of other groups who were considered to be victims who were to be executed. These Masons may have been Jewish, Russian, Polish, or disabled. They may have become mentally ill, or may have been gay males, another group who were held in disdain by the Nazis and suitable for execution. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. has an entire section devoted to the treatment of Freemasons by the Nazi regime. The truth is that while Hitler saw Masonry as being part of the Jewish problem, only a small percentage of Freemasons were of the Jewish faith. For hundreds of years, the Freemasons had endured persecution solely because they were members of the Masonic fraternity. Prior to the 1930s, the Masonic Grand Lodges in Germany were in a state of disarray. Studies indicate that there were nine lodges with a total of about 75,000 brethren. These Grand Lodges were split into two groups. Dating from the 1700s, the Grand Lodges formed were called the Old Prussian Lodges. Later lodges, those formed from the 1800s until about 1924, were called the Humanitarian Lodges. The Old Prussian Lodges were strongly nationalistic and strongly pro-Christian in nature. Non-Christians were not permitted to join the Old Prussian Lodges. In 1922, a schism developed 
and the old Prussian lodges separated from the humanitarian lodges in the Confederation of Masonic Grand Lodges. This allowed the growing Nazi party to treat the two Masonic groups very differently. The old Prussian lodges chose to support Hitler. The humanitarian lodges, together with the Scottish Rite Supreme Council, chose to support the opposition. In 1930, the Brethren broke away from one of the German Grand Lodges and joined with the Grand Lodge of France. This newly formed organization was called the Symbolic Grand Lodge of Germany. Nazism and National Socialism In spite of all the contradictions, Freemasonry stands here as a fighter for individual freedom, for humanity and mankind. The fight has begun, quote-unquote, the magazine went on to state. National Socialism is the enemy of Freemasonry. The symbolic lodge of Germany ceased to exit after Hitler's taking of power. Adolf Hitler was arrested on November 11, 1923 for his role in the Beer Hall Putsch, or Pooch. After a 24-day trial, he was convicted and sentenced to a term of five years in prison. During this incarnation, he wrote Mein Kampf, My Struggle, or My Battle. The first volume of Mein Kampf was published in 1925, with the second volume published in 1926. Hitler saw his main fight against the Jews, whom he saw as taking over the world. In Hitler's view, Jews were in charge in the political spectrum and the press. However, Hitler saw Freemasonry as part of a giant Jewish conspiracy. He visualized Freemasonry as being in league with the Jewish-controlled press. One of the Nazi Party's means of inflaming the German people against Freemasonry was the dissemination of a letter entitled Guide and Instructional Letter. This stated that the natural hostility of the peasant against the Jews and the hostility against the Freemason as a servant of the Jew must be worked up to a frenzy. During Kristallnacht, a mobilizing cry was Death to the Jews and the Freemasons. In 1942, Hitler felt that Freemasons and the ideological enemies of the National Socialist Party were the cause of World War II. As a result, he ordered Alfred Rosenberg to confiscate all Masonic libraries, archives, and lodges. These lodges were converted into anti-Masonic museums where anti-Masonry was promulgated. At the time, Heinrich Himmler said that espionage against Germany was carried out by the Jews and Freemasons. As the Nazis invaded other countries, the war spread throughout Europe. The prejudice against the Freemasons was exported to those countries conquered by the Nazi war machine. In June 1940, Germany was the victor over France. The Vichy government dissolved the Grand Orient and the Grand Lodge of France. All Masonic property was seized and disposed of by the Vichy government. A great number of French Freemasons were arrested. 1,000 Freemasons were deported and 1,000 were said to have been killed. When the Germans invaded Belgium, anti-Masonic feeling was already high. Anti-Masonic thought has apparently continued until relatively recent times. It was reported that Belgian Masons were shot in their homes, and many died in the prison camps. Italy had a long history of anti-Masonic prejudice. Benito Mussolini ordered that all members of the fascist party who were Freemasons had to quit either the Masonic or fascist organizations. In 1925, Mussolini decried that Freemasonry was a political organization and Freemasonry was dissolved. A Masonic martyr was General Capello. He was a prominent fascist as well as a deputy grand master of the Orient, Italy's predominant Grand Lodge. General Capello quit the fascist party rather than sever his Masonic relationship. He was later arrested and sentenced to 30 years in jail. Because many Freemasons were also Jews, it is difficult to determine whether an interred person was sent to the prison camps because he was Jewish or because he was a Mason. This is the reason for the large discrepancy in the numbers of Masons thought to be interred during the Nazi occupation. The fact remains, though, that the Holocaust had a dire effect on Freemasonry and went a long way in an effort to totally destroy the Masonic fraternity. There is some good news, however. After the war, Freemasons, like the Phoenix, started to arise from the ashes. Lodges were reinstituted in all countries conquered by the Nazis. Once again, Freemasonry survived a crippling attack, proving the value of an organization worthy of being one of the world's premier fraternal organizations. 
In the spring 2009 issue of the magazine Illinois Freemason, the inside cover had a story entitled Forget-Me-Not. This article reported that in 1947 the Grand Lodge of the Sun and Birth adopted a pin in the shape of a forget-me-not flower in remembrance of the Holocaust and as a pledge that these horrors should not happen again. Much of the Masonic material confiscated by the Nazis was never recovered. At the end of World War II, the items that survived were dispersed among the winning countries. Much material disappeared into the Soviet Union. However, the Grand Lodge of Scotland has an extensive collection of Masonic material and libraries. There is also a large collection of salvaged Masonic memorabilia held by the United States Holocaust Museum. I would like to close by giving thanks to the United States Holocaust Museum and the Illinois Holocaust Museum. Well, there you have it. Great piece by Brother Ira Gilbert. I should also go ahead and mention that there is a great article which talks about the forget-me-not flower and that pin. The story that's attached to that pin is largely false. The little card that comes with it is a, a fanciful, romanticized uh, myth. Virtually none of what's on that little card is true. There's a wonderful kind of expose done on this that I will find, and I'll add a link to it in our show notes. It's pretty fascinating, and I'm not saying, you know, we kill the symbol of the forget-me-not. I think it still has meaning in that we can wear that pin in memory of the Holocaust, and Freemasons choose to wear it whenever. But the story, again, on the card is false. Hello, Whence Came You fans. This is Brother Joe Martinez from Manassas, Virginia. Your illustrious host, Brother Robert Johnson, has allowed me to take a few seconds of his program to remind you about our very special event, the inaugural Mid-Atlantic Esotericon, which will be held on June 15th, 2019 at Manassas Lodge number 182 in Manassas, Virginia. This all-day event will include both tiled and untiled presentations from many of your favorite esoteric authors and speakers to include John T. Ruark, Frater O, Greg Kaminsky, P.D. Newman, Pierce Vaughn, Jamie Lamb, Don McAndrews, and your very own Robert Johnson. Vendors will include the ever-popular Masonic Revival and Ascended Masters Clothing. Lunch will be catered with coffee and snacks available throughout the entire day. Tickets have been selling quickly, and we do have a limited seating capacity, so do not miss out. The brew night on June 14th is already sold out, and tickets for the event will be sold until we run out, or April 15th, 2019, whichever comes first. For more information, visit us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash maesotericon, or to purchase tickets, please visit tinyurl.com forward slash maesotericon, or search eventbrite.com for mid-Atlantic Esotericon. If you're looking for a more introspective, thought-provoking, and deeply engaging way to start your summer, look no further than the Mid-Atlantic Esotericon. Again, tickets are going very quickly, so get yours today. And as always, thank you to my dear brother, Robert Johnson, for this time to promote what will certainly be an event to remember. All right, now it is, if you're listening to this, on Sunday when this came out on the 17th of March 2019, then in just a few days, I will be at Gateway Lodge number 40 in St. Louis, Missouri. The presentation is going to be Esoterics 101. It's a good presentation. Consider coming out for that. It'll be likely 40 to 45 minutes. It could go up to an hour, depending on questions and answer sessions. But ultimately, we'll give you a base on which to form your future foundation or maybe some just additional mortar, if you will, for your building as it relates to the understanding of some of the esoteric or internal teachings of Freemasonry. As we really look at an example of esoterics, we look at the organizations around the world and throughout history that teach these things. We look at Freemasonry as one of those systems, and finally we give a few elements of the quote-unquote revelation within Freemasonry as Freemasonry and its teachings attempt to make you a better person. Anyway, 
That's it for this week. I hope to see you all March 19th. And then later at the end of this month, I'll be in Victorville Lodge in California. And I'll be doing that same presentation, Esoterics 101, I believe. And I'll be staying with my good friend, Brother Jack, while I'm out there. So I'm excited to see Jack. It's been too long. Brother Jack was a past master here in my home district and was a recent past master of his own lodge here, Rising Sun, number 115. And, uh... Now he's out in California chasing the dream, uh, living the dream, I should say. So really happy for him and his lady. But that's it. So again, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much for supporting this program. Thanks so much for subscribing on YouTube. Thank you to everybody out there who shares these episodes with your friends. When you have a profane, you say, hey, if you want to know more about masonry, check out this podcast and keep coming down to this lodge every week and we can talk about stuff. This is what we strive to do. It's what we want to bring to lodges. It's what we want to bring to the people out there under the larger umbrella of Freemasonry. So thanks again. And until next week, stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. Take care. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition 